God used the same tongue to unite. If we go back to Acts chapter 2, and we don't have to turn there because I'm just recapping and trying to hurry through, but we have a bunch of different people gathered in the upper room praying for the Holy Ghost to come, having their meal, whatever they were doing. Depending on what you think the upper room was, that's a whole other discussion. But they were sent there to wait for the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yes. And as we're reading the chapter, they're not amazed that they hear men speaking in other tongues, per se. What's amazed was, the Bible says, to quote it, when they heard every man speaking in their own tongue or their own language. And that's what made the difference. These men, yes, they had a common language, but they all had their own personal dialects from the areas that they were from. I mean, if you look at the Spanish language, if you go across the world, there's different variations of Spanish. If you go into different, if you go into different parts of the United States, there are different, there's different aspects of the English language. You go out west, they, they drink pop. You come here, we drink soda. Somewhere in between, they drink soda pop. You know, there's different variations. In our own culture, you have the Dutch, they have kind of their own dialect. I mean, so for us to understand, it's not that far off for us to have a hard grasp on it. We all have a common language, but there's different dialects that different sects may speak. That's exactly what was going on in Acts chapter 2. They heard everybody speaking in their own language. That was the sign of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but that was also God uniting the church through the diversity of tongues because everyone knew that. Hey, Peter might be speaking this dialect, but he doesn't know that dialect. So God unites the church through the diversity of tongues. Now, Moving on quickly, what is the purpose, let me back up, when it comes to the gift of tongues, and I stress the gift of tongues, just remember, tongues, there is your own prayer language, that is not the gift of tongues, that is separate, that is something that you have received from the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that is your prayer language, you may pray it often in your own corner while you're praying, but that is not the gift of tongues. So, who is the gift of tongues for? Unsaved. The unsaved, for the unbeliever. Now, when we look at tongues, it is for the unsaved, but when someone speaks and is used in the gift of tongues, who does it profit? Just reiterating, because this seems to be one of the topics that I see in the church world, not just here, but that I get the most questions on, on the two just blending. So, if somebody speaks and is used in just the gift of tongues, who's being edified? Who's being blessed? The person speaking the tongues. They are the ones being edified. Now we come to the question, why are they, only, why are they the only ones being edified at that point? Well, I would even say, I don't want to say that they understand it and they know it because then we get into the gift of interpretation and prophecy. So maybe God's giving them the answer, but that's not always the case. Some people, they just have the gift of tongues. They don't have the gift of interpretation or the gift of prophecy. So when it comes down to the reason why are they being blessed is because they're the ones that God is moving on. He, that's the one where the anointing is for the time being. And they get a special blessing for themselves. If, they, if there is no interpretation and there's just tongues, is that necessarily a bad thing? No, it is not. For one of two reasons. A, maybe there's somebody in the congregation who knows that language that was spoken. And God was speaking to them. Because guess what? Not God, everything God speaks to you is meant for everybody else to know in the first place. There are some things that are just between you and God. Second of all, and that is a rare occasion, but it is a possibility. Second thing is, maybe somebody missed it. 
Maybe somebody missed the interpretation. Maybe God was expecting to use some way and they just missed it. Or, the other thing is, maybe the person who was using the gift of tongues, they just got excited and they got happy. When it comes down to either one of those, we should be, in the case of if there's no interpretation or prophecy given, if we have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we should still be praying, God, use me. You know, let me be used. We should be constantly seeking. And if we have some of the gifts, we should be seeking for more of the gifts. There's nothing wrong with being greedy when it comes to the things of God. But on the flip side, if the other person got happy, then you know what? We ought to be big enough Christians to just be happy that God blessed. If God didn't have a message for the church, you know what? That's fine. If they're getting blessed, good for brother or sister so-and-so that's being used. We ought to be good, big enough person. And guess what? Maybe even if they did mess it, maybe it was just the Holy Ghost interrupting the church service and things are about to break out. If we would really seek in and get in ourselves. Anything could happen. But, A, if there's no interpretation, maybe it's meant for somebody in the audience that knows that, con that word and God is speaking to them. B, maybe somebody else missed it in the congregation. Maybe God was wanting to use them and they just weren't willing or they weren't available. Or maybe they had the message and they didn't have enough faith to step forward and let it come out. Or C, the, the person who was being used in the gift of tongues just got excited and was getting blessed on his own or her own. And we all ought to be big enough Christians to say, you know what, good for them. Just let them be. No one needs to say anything bad or anything. Because we're all here for one reason, and that's to worship and get close to God. But when it comes to tongues, nine times out of ten, there is meant to be an interpretation. Because why does tongues only benefit? Well, let me ask you this. Where, what is the purpose of the gifts? Let me back up and go there. What are the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit? And I'm having a blank on the verse myself. It gives you more power. It gives you more power, brother, but I think you can have a particular verse, and I just can't get there because there's one. Um, it's meant to edify the body of church. Edification, exhortation. It's slipping. This is what happens when I go off my notes. But basically, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, they're meant to edify the body of Christ. They're meant to build it up. That is what the purpose of the gift is for. So when somebody is using the gift of tongues and they are the only ones that's being used and there is no interpretation or prop, uh, no interpretation to it, it doesn't benefit the body because we don't know what's being said. That's what it comes down to. And when God, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, they are meant to edify the church. The other reason being is, and Paul. I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself or not, but Paul goes on later in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that's where we're going to be for a little bit. But I think it's 14, he uses the illustration that if somebody comes in the church and everybody's speaking in tongues, that it's all madness. Why is that madness? Because they don't understand what's going on and if everybody's speaking in tongues, it's not benefiting anybody who's but except for the ones that are speaking in the other tongue or being used in the gift, either way. Now, our interpretation of the tongues is meant so the congregation can understand it. Would someone please read 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 8 and 9? So Paul uses the example of the trumpet and during military or time of war, and that you're looking for a particular sound or a particular tune, and that instructs you on what to do. But if everybody's just going off the wall, then there's no real instruction. So uh, there's no, no one knows what's going on. Now, also, there must be an interpretation for this reason. 
Would someone please read verses 23 and 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14? First Corinthians 14, 23 and 24. I'll go ahead and read it. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that they are mad? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And the reason coming back to is this. If everyone's speaking in tongues, or one is used in the gift of tongues and there's no interpretation, there's no understanding. But when it comes to the gift of interpretation, that's when understanding is provided, that's when the message is provided, and that's when the whole church is edified. Because we now know what God is trying to speak to the church. Now, if someone speaks in an unknown tongue, coming back to that, they are speaking directly to God. If someone would please read verse 2 of chapter 14. speaketh in an unknown tongue, and speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. So when it comes to someone who is used in the gift of tongues, or someone that is even um, praying in tongues, they do not always know what they are praying, they do not always know what they are saying. The Bible says that they are speaking mysteries. And we talked about this a little bit, but we'll go down through the last list on page 30 of our notes from last week. If someone is used in the gift of tongues and there is no translation, there are several things we need to keep in mind. And we've already said it time and time again. The very first thing that we should not do is look down upon. Well, they missed it. That's all oh, so-and-so. They're just getting excited again. <coughs> we should be, first of all, whether God's using them or they're just getting excited, we ought to be big enough people to say, you know what? God bless them. And not saying God bless them, but literally, God, you bless them. Give them a special blessing. Whatever they need right now, Lord, you just give them above and beyond anything they could ask or think. Because really, when it comes to the church, we are to be servants to one to another. Because it's not just about me. It's not just about you. When we look at the church, we make up the whole body. Paul makes sure to reiterate that, that not everybody is the hand, not everybody is the head, not everybody is the foot. We all have a role to play. And when all those members come together, they are one body. It's not just brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, but really it's all of us. Yes, and we are to work as one body. So if somebody is being used in the gift of tongues, whether God is using them and there's no interpretation, or whether they are just getting excited, we should be big enough people to say, you know what, God bless them and move on. Or the other thing that we should not say is, you know what, they can get the tongues, now let them translate it. I've actually heard of that being done in a church service already. A uh, woman at the Bible school that was an instructor years and years and years and many moons ago, her mom was in a church service and her mom gave a message in tongues. You know the preacher shut down the whole service and said she gave the tongues, now she must interpret. No. We are not to do that. Just because they have, first of all, just because they have the gift of tongues does not mean that they have the gift of interpretation. Now he was using the verse um, 13, 1 Corinthians 14, 13. And let me just quote that. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Yes, he should or she should pray that they should interpret. But once again, we come back. God's not given it. Most people don't have all the gifts of the Spirit working in their life. They really don't. God gives severally as he will. Some may have one. Some may have all nine. But the Bible says, let him pray that he may interpret. But really, when it gets down to it, Everyone that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost ought to be praying for God, give me the interpretation that I may be used for your glory. We all should be seeking that. And if we have one gift, we should be seeking more gifts. But 
We do not shut down the entire service and say, well, they gave you the tongues, now they must interpret it. First of all, you kill the service. Second of all, can you only imagine how that made that individual feel? Because now all the pressure's on them. So God, was this really of you, or, or was it just me getting excited? And when it comes down to it, really, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, they are to edify the body of Christ. When we do such things, are we really edifying the body of Christ? God does not receive glory for such actions. Now, when it comes to speaking in tongues, there are some rules for speaking in tongues, or at least one. And that is mentioned in verse 27 of chapter 14, where the Bible states, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or three, but or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. And we're covering this because this is one of the most misunderstood verses of the Bible, I think, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. Because there are all kinds of teachings out there on it. There are all kinds of beliefs on it. There's all kinds of feelings on it. There are people that will say that what this means is there can only be two or three tongues and interpretations in a service, and that is it. That's all God wants for that service. There are some that say that you can have two or three tongues, but then one must interpret. And I'm sure there's other variations of it. But the thing is, if we're going to go with the theory that it's only two or three tongues and interpretation for service, how long is the church service? So let me pose that question to you. How long is the church service? Is it until our belly rumbles? Is it until we get tired and go home? There should be no set time for a church service. As the Holy Ghost is leading it, you should go by the Spirit of God. It's not by man, but by the Holy Ghost. Well, let's go this way, bro. Let's just kind of step out away from that one a little bit in the sense that we start at 7. On 30 on Tuesdays, some churches may start at 7 on a Wednesday. Is there anything in the Bible that states that a church service must be X number of minutes? No. No. So how long is a church service then? If it's only two or three tongues of interpretations per church service, then how do we know who's out of line? I mean, we can have a half an hour church service and if there's uh, five tongues of interpretation, well, then who's the two people that missed it? Or if we have a church service, they say that um, Catherine Pullman's church services sometimes went two days without stopping. So for two days, there could only be two tongues and two interpretations, uh, two or three tongues and interpretations. And because that's how long the church service was. Anything beyond that. If there would have been five or six and say five or six different people used, somebody missed it somewhere. How do we know who missed it? The key to this verse lies in one phrase that's smack dab in the middle. And that by force. What that means is this. Somebody gives tongues. Someone else gives tongues. Someone else gives tongues. And maybe they're all the same people. Just, we have three tongues. What Paul's saying is to show the unbeliever that this is not madness, and so there is not madness and chaos in the church. We have had three tongues. Now we need an interpretation. Once that interpretation is given, okay, we can go back to two, three tongues again. But once we get the third one, there needs to be an interpretation. Because there is an order to things. Well, if some people that believe that one person can have three tongues, and then there are some that believe that it can be three tongues and they say the church. Yep. And that's what we're talking about. But when you study this verse, we find that they're wrong. 
is the fact that it comes down to that key phrase and that by course. What is a course? It is a straight line of half your own. If I'm walking down this aisle and here's tongues, here's tongues, here's tongues, now somebody needs to interpret before I can go any farther. There's been an interpretation. Here's tongues, here's tongues, here's tongues. Now before we go anywhere else in this church service, we need to have an interpretation. Because if we don't, and so we all of a sudden start having tongues, 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 and all the way through the church, where's the ordering? Who's being edified? Only the people being blessed. So, it comes down to that two or three, let me come back to the verse. Verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. And then we get the famous verse. And if there's no interpretation, let him pray that he may interpret. That does not mean that, once again, it does not mean that the person gave the tongue is obligated to give the interpretation. Because not. God gives everyone different gifts. Maybe he has it. Maybe the person being used in tongues has to give their interpretation. But this verse is not stating that they must interpret. Let them pray. But we all, when we come up and back to that verse before, and two or three at the most, and that by course. So then two or three are used in tongues, and then one interprets before we go any farther. And we go back to the words of the Apostle Paul. He was talking about chaos and confusion. So he's giving instruction. When we look at the church of Corinth, Paul had to give them a lot of instruction. And it's good because guess what? We need this instruction today. We really do. We are living in a time in the church world where the gifts are being, it's not just the gifts. It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost too that it just seems like it's fading in the distance because more and more people aren't seeking after the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They are seeking after, and the ones that have it, it seems like we sit on the pew and we're content once we get it, when there's so much more that God has for us. So when we look at this, and that, just coming back and reiterate, just because it's one or two in the does not mean that we should do away with speaking the gift of tongues in general, because it's a gift. God has it out there for a reason. It's a gift to the church. It's meant to edify the church. So we are not to do away with the gift, but rather Paul is giving us understanding on how to understand it. And just going off of verse 39, the Bible states, Wherefore, brethren, brethren, covet to prophesy, but he speaks this as well, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Yes, tongues may seem like a minor or lesser gift, but it's really not. The gifts of the Spirit are not minor. They are meant to edify the church. They are meant to help the church. They are to then to help us grow individually and as a whole. Yes, the gift of tongues by itself is only really edifying that individual. Unless there's somebody that speaks that um, language in the audience. And it comes back to the point that there's no understanding. But, nine times out of ten, there's meant to be an interpretation. Because the gifts of the Spirit are meant to edify the body of the church as a whole. Now we have about ten minutes. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to ask? I'm really not trying to beat a dead horse, but I can't tell you how many times when I get questions about the gift of the Spirit and the, uh, the gift of tongues and tongues itself, and they just are constantly blending. And as we read the Word of God itself, if we're not careful, we know if we don't know what we're looking at, brother Eli, it's very easy to confuse tongues with the gift of tongues. It really is. But what does the Bible instruct us to do? It instructs us to study, to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that he is not to be ashamed, but rightly divided the word of truth. Now, there are so many things 
in this world that we can look at and go, wow. But when we have a greater understanding, that's when we can put things in perspective. Years and years and years ago, I took a trip to New York City. It was right after 9-11 struck, and they were still cleaning out the mess. Me and one under, other individual was up by the fence washing them as they cleaned up. And they were just awestruck with what was going on. The fact that the Twin Towers came down. But while the Twin Towers were a beacon and a symbol, because they were a big accomplishment for that time, they really were. There were three other lesser known buildings that actually went with them that made up the complex. And when you realize that the Twin Towers didn't stand by the suspect, man, they were part of a complex. That just puts things into perspective. It helps us have a better understanding. Yes, we lost the great symbol of America. Yes, many lives were lost. There's a lot of debris. But it makes a big difference when we know what we're looking at, when understanding is provided. And when we know what we're looking at with the Word of God, things get clear. That's why we read the Word of God every single day. That's why we study the Word of God every day. Because the more we read, the more we study, and the more we let the Holy Ghost deal with us, the more we can look at that and say, oh, that verse, I now better understand that verse. Or, as we're reading the Word of God, oh, this verse can connect with, in the Old Testament, connects with the New, this New Testament verse. And now I see how they go together. Just like when we look, we can come to Easter Sunday, and we know that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And we get awestruck that, you know, Jesus died for me. But man, when we start looking at verses like Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where he shall bruise, uh, the serpent shall bruise his heel, but he, his heel, he shall bruise the serpent, then we get better. You know what? That's looking at Jesus Christ on the cross. As we're looking at the children of Israel in the wilderness, and Moses raises up that brazen serpent, man, that's great for them. They had something that they could look for, and they received instant healing from all the snake bites. But as we study the Word of God and our eyes get light, enlightened, you mean to tell me that that brazen serpent on that cross was a picture of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for my salvation? Well, that puts things better and more perspective, and now we can look at that with a whole different meaning. Or when we look at even our own salvation experience, that, man, how did God know that we were going to sin? How did he know that we would need a Savior? I mean, did he, that all happen in the garden after Adam sinned? But then we come to Revelation 13 and verse 8, where the Bible says that Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then all of a sudden we get taken back. You know what? Jesus died on the cross, but he knew I was going to mess up all the way from the very, very beginning. Back when God said everything was perfect, he knew that we would sin and that we'd need a Savior. And God made sure that everything was laid out from the very beginning. We can look at things and not really understand fully what we're, under, what we're looking at. But when we get understanding, that's when we can start connecting the pieces. And that's why we need to study the Word of God, because things like the gifts of the Spirit and uh, the gift of tongues and tongues itself, if we're not paying attention, they can get mumble jumbled and all confused. But man, study the word of God that we may separate, that we may know what we're looking at. The words of the Apostle Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. The more that we know him, the more that we study his word, that we may know him, the more that we can understand what we're looking at in the word of God. Because if we're not careful, when we first start reading the Bible, it can seem overpowering, or we're just trying along, even the New Testament, oh, this relates to me, but we don't really get the full grasp of things. But the more that we live this Christian life, the closer we get to God, the more we realize how everything's connected, how things just flow together, and that even though the Bible is written by 40 different authors in five different languages, I believe it was, on like three different continents, through all of history, for the most part, there's not one discrepancy. And the more we study and the more we get closer to God, the more we realize just how everything pieces together. And that's how we get a better understanding of who God is and to know. And it's not that we're going to know Him in every way, but we need to do our best to know what God has for us. Because this is our instruction right here. This is our way of life. 
The Holy Ghost does speak verbally to us at times. But man, how does God speak to us typically on a daily basis? Through His Word. And it's a matter of us diving into it and understanding it. That we can understand these things. Because when it comes to the Word of God, it's not just about us understanding it. But as we grow in grace, as we become aged as a Christian, not just as an individual, because time moves by way too quickly. It really does. But when we look at our lifespan as a Christian, all those years that we've been in Christ and constantly growing, there's people coming up behind us that are not as, I hate to say advanced in the things of God, but what about our young people? Do we know enough of the Word to try to help them in their Christian walk? Do we know enough to help guide them? Because we've already sought the answer for ourselves. Now we need to pass it on. The Bible speaks about the elderly women teaching the younger women. And the same thing is true of us men. The older men should teach the younger men. Not just age, um, older in age, but older, older in our Christian walk. Because we've gleaned with God. We've walked with God. We've let Him change us. We know the Word of God, the battles we've had in trying to understand it and maybe piece things together. So when somebody starts talking to us about perhaps, uh, where can I go in the Bible and read about facts and prayer? Hopefully we don't just tell them, oh, go to the book of Isaiah or go to this book and expect them to read the whole book because guess what? They may not know what they're looking for. But we've been there. We've done that because we've studied the Word of God and because we've studied it for ourselves and we can rightly divide it. Now we can pass it on to somebody else. Well, here, let me sit down and let me show you these verses so you know what you're looking for. Because in any trade, in any trade, if we're learning something, if someone just tells you, well, go do this, well, if you've never done it before, do you really know what you're doing? Do you really know what you're looking at? No, we're, we're back at the Twin Towers once again. We know that they came down, but we don't fully understand what we're looking at. We're just fixated on the Twin Towers, but we don't realize all the other things that are going on around it. We need to dive into the Word of God, that we may study it, that we may separate it. Because we're going to talk about next week. Uh, well, let me back up. We've talked and focused a lot on the gifts that Christ has given to the church. Well, next week, we're going to talk about how are we using the gifts that God's given us to benefit the church. And with that said, let us bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. And children of faith, everything God be done, peacefully and in order. Amen. Exactly. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's no like you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires, make himself visible when he so chooses. I pray, Lord, that you anoint the song leader and the musicians, that they praise you upon the stringed instruments, upon the vocal cords, Lord. As they lead us in the songs you have us to sing, anoint the pastor's mind and his books as he brings forth your word today, Lord. And I anoint our minds and our hearts that they would be proud of the that day would be good soil for your word to follow, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, Lord, that would be changed into your very first, Lord. For Lord, use, we pray that each one of us, that as we walk this Christian life, that we would allow you to change us from glory to glory, even more and more so, in the very image of Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.